Hey guys, Dov here, back with my first underrated lord. And it is, of course, Tehenuin, the prophet of Sotek on his, uh, his big old, what is this? Engine of the Gods, I think? I, I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> his giant orbital bombardment sun ray mount, I don't even know, giant death stegodon, let's call it, <laughs> with two, this is a Felcon, of course, this is from a recent stream of his, those of you guys who haven't checked out his channel, definitely be sure to do so, you get some very high level games from one of the all-time goats, the greatest of all time, absolutely, he is up there among that class, uh, so yeah, he's got uh, Tehenuin, double rev crystal here, I believe this stream was an all Tehenuin stream, so if you guys want to go back and check that, I, I believe the VOD is up on his channel. Got two sacred Rock'em Sock'em Croxigors as well, haven't talked about these guys yet, um, I, I kind of need to play around with them a little bit more and, and see, I think they could potentially be underrated as well. We've got Razordons, who are very solid, and uh, yeah, a bunch of Saurus and Skinks up against this defensive... Uh, not Wood Elf, but High Wood Elf player. <laughs> high Elves in the woods. I've got a staunch line of spears, Silver and Guard here, plus Spearmen. We've got Phoenix Guard in the second line, including the Keepers of the Flame. And some Sisters of Avalorn. One of them, of course, being the Ever Queen's Court Guards with Teclis on horseback. So no terror, but basically infinite winds of magic with the Ever Queen's Court Guards and... Uh, and uh, Teclis, we've also got Talons of Torcoleta, so looking for some pretty obvious fire synergy with that staunch line of spears in the woods to uh, help, you know, debuff the dinos a little bit. But there is a secondary consideration to the woods that will work in uh, Falcon's favor here, which is, of course, that he can potentially drop shots. And here, Isle Player makes a pretty horrendous mistake. Now, you might say this is great to try and snipe this Skink Priest, but that net gets wasted and could have been used right here onto Henowin. And obviously, Felcon would have tried to pull him back and not take that in the face, but the Distraction Skink with just Wind Blast takes one for the team. That allows Henowin to get into the line completely unopposed. And now he's going to start doing his thing. Tehenuin being a Lore of Beast caster is the only uh, Lord level Lore of Beast caster for the Lizardmen. <clears throat> he's also an absolute monster in and of himself, uh, a beast, if you will. He's going to summon up a Manticore here. And also, that Ward of Barbarin is a consideration as well. Teclis drops his uh, Fiery Convocation there in the front line. Does quite a bit of damage to the Saurus, but some of them were able to pull away there. And it didn't do too much. Mostly just routed Skinks and so on. The Croc scores have pushed through. You can see they're inundating one of these units of uh, Sisters. Actually, multiple units of Sisters. Being attacked by the Keepers of the Flame, not great for them, but they'll be able to at least do some damage in the meantime. Meanwhile, it looks like the Rev Crystal just popped off, healing to Henowin. He has taken quite a bit of damage from that uh, armor-piercing missile fire. Now the Manticore, though, helping to disrupt, as is the second Rev Crystal. And here comes an orbital bombardment from to Henowin. Does force the High Elf player to move his uh, Ever Queen's Court Guards and other sisters. Even though, you know, it didn't necessarily hit a lot of them, uh, this high Elf player did a good job of dodging that, but even in that in and of itself, you know, forcing those sisters to move does mean that they're not going to be able to fire for a second. He's going to need to re-micro them to, you know, retarget them on this, uh, an appropriate target. Uh, this unit of Croc scores ends up getting routed off from the Halberds, but this other one finds a gap in the line. And again, despite the, the debuffs of the woods, I mean, it's only a 20% debuff. They're still going to get in here and do some serious work against all of these High Elves. Manticore also being pulled up, a second Manticore here to continue this absolute destruction of the High Elf lines. You can see they're all, you know, uh, they're fighting tooth and nail. I mean, they are High Elves, they're not getting completely pushed over, but this back line, all of these sisters have been heavily inundated. And since this is in the woods, we'll keep it up close with Tehenowin as he mashes on with the Skinks. Awesome yellow Skinks for the, the Cult of Sotek. <clears throat> Absolutely awesome. Saurus also moving in. And the Manticore's Lore of Beasts is just such a strong lore in general. Um, the fact that he has Arcane Conduit helps make up for the fact that he's not a Slon. He's, again, the only Lord level caster who's not a Slon uh, for the Lizardmen, at least right now. I know that, I think there's a Skink Oracle, is, if I remember right, who's in the lore. I don't know if he'll ever get added to Total War Warhammer, like maybe in game 3 or something for a DLC. That'd be cool. For the time being, though, Tehenowin's the only uh, Lord level Skink caster, only Lore Beast caster, and he does have uh, Arcane Conduit to help make up for the fact, although I don't think Velcon actually brought it here. Uh, regardless, uh, 
The Engine of the Gods does provide an improved power recharge rate, and this one here as well, 5% uh, damage resistance isn't a lot, but especially these high health single entities, it will make a difference. You can see Tehenuin's very low here, but he's getting that Revification Crystal. Felcon's been able to consistently apply that throughout the course of the battle. And now here comes this Fiery Convocation once again, forcing those Phoenix Guard to move. So the Croc Scores can kind of get attacks in their rear as they pull away. Croc Scores, of course, the Rock'em Sock'em Sacreds have magic attacks, will be very good against the physical resistance of the Phoenix Guard. Phoenix Guard coming in with a pretty good amount of physical resistance here, 30%. Uh, on top of their heavy armor makes them very tanky, especially against certain targets. But they do have a pretty low HP pool. The Talons of Torquileta absolutely getting torn by the teeth of Tom. Yeah, let's call him Tom, because that goes with the alliteration. Um, and uh, Sacred Croxor is also pushing back. Looks like we're going to have uh, one last Orbital Bombardment here to clip those Phoenix Guard. They are kind of bunched up, and even though they do pull away, some of them will still get hit by that. They're not going to take too much damage, but again, forcing them to move means they're not getting attacks, and good old Tom is uh, getting attacks in their back all the while. The, the Because the archers have been focused on all the big dinosaurs as well, there's been absolutely nothing to compete against these hunting packs. This Wood Elf build lacked mobility in any of any kind as well, so these hunting packs honestly have been uh, doing great work. They haven't got a lot of chevron action, but that consistent armor-piercing damage on especially like these Phoenix Guard is going to be super important into the late game. Balance power still very close, all things considered. The High Elves have made a, a valiant stand in the woods, um, but this is not good for Techless. <laughs> oh, Techless, you're not on your Phoenix, buddy, and even if you were, this probably wouldn't be a great engagement for you, just because Tehenuin's such a strong uh, combatant. I mean, he really doesn't have amazing melee attack and defense up on this guy, but 500 weapon strength with that frenzy active, 76 charge bonus is very, very serious. Stegodons in general are very charge oriented. A lot of people um, tend to miss that, but they have very high charge bonus, uh, you know, on par with something not quite like a griffin, but, you know, like other charge oriented monsters. Um, super, super strong. We're going to come in here and su support these Sacred Croc scores to Hennowin Will with his little skate bros. Oh man, he's got an arrow like directly in his head. Ah, uh, he's fine. He's fine. He's totally fine. You know, he's just wax it off with the tablet and uh, it is totally okay. No problem there. <laughs> the Bastildon, uh, the other one here, is going to come in and help support as well. Balance power starting to turn at this point as a lot of the High Elf troops have been rounded off and Teclis is starting to get uh, surrounded and isolated. Most of the Phoenix Guard are gone, just a handful of Spearmen here, so... Yeah, very good game. Big thanks to Felcon for sending that one in. I actually was watching the stream and I said, hey, send this to me, that's a really good... It's It was a while ago, I've been... Uh, <clears throat> I'll say I, I had been waiting to cast it until this and I totally did not forget, no, absolutely not, totally not, uh, just forget to cast it, but uh, yeah, it was a great showcase of a very underrated lord in my opinion, and also a pretty pretty interesting build against the High Elves. The High Elves likewise, you know, he definitely went for a certain play there, and I see what he was going for. I do think any build without any uh, without any kind of high mass units, uh, outside of dwarfs obviously, because you kinda, kind of can't not do that, <laughs> um, but any, any other faction, uh, not bringing any high mass units or, you know, mobility um, that, can, that can try and at least block some of these higher mass units from getting into your back line, like, like those croc scores just punching straight through. Um, you'd need something like that to protect a big infantry line like this, especially with this many expensive archers. You just need, like, even cutting <clears throat> a couple of these spearmen or um, Malyrian Reaver, or honestly, not the biggest fan of... I guess there was only two Phoenix Guard here. Interesting. Yeah, you could cut this third spear for even, like, an Illyrian Reaver. Um, maybe fix some funds somewhere else to try and find the funds for that would be enough to at least to momentarily help hold back and like support a unit of spears so they don't get run through. Um, but regardless, 129 kills for Tehenuin plus the two manticores that we didn't see. Um, just tons of utility honestly with that and of course he's got some other abilities that we'll look at in just a second uh, giving the AoE poison and everything. Um, and yeah, double rev crystal gives him the healing that he would otherwise lack being that uh, there's no floor of life skink obviously. So just kind of talking, whoops, not that, looking, talking about, uh, kind of went in a little more detail here. Um, yeah, he is not the worst Lizardman Lord. I mean, you've got Nakai and Tic-Tac-Toe are definitely uh, less competitive, I'll say. Um, he is one of the more 
competitive lords, but people often forget about him just because he's not Mazdamundi, he's not, uh, you know, uh, he can't ride a Carnosaur like the Old Blood. <clears throat> he's just, he's just kind of there, um, and he's not one of these other slons that has a different lore, but again, Lore of Beasts is super strong. I would definitely recommend taking Arcane Conduit as well as Wildheart, um, especially on this mount. That makes him not quite as strong as a slon, but you can get pretty close. You don't have the same amount of power reserve, obviously, um, but you do have a good amount, especially when you stack these together. Like, you'd wait, use your Arcane Conduit until right after you cast a spell, while that Wild Heart is active, then you stack this Arcane Conduit to get the maximum amount of power reserve and recharge rate at the same time. Um, and the, the spells as well, you've got a number of really nice spells here. Transformation of Kadan, of course, is completely ubiquitous in every every matchup, basically, where you, you can take this spell, you will see it uh, often. Um, uh, Pan's Impenetrable Pelt is a pretty good one as well, uh, especially for the Lizardmen if you're facing non-magic damage. Here in this battle, there was a lot of magic damage from the sisters, so this wouldn't have been super helpful. But in other matchups, certainly, um, you can use this to help uh, repel missile fire on a high value monster and make it a little bit faster as it crashes into your enemy's line. Uh, Amber Spear, it's okay if you want to try and get a skill side, sh side shot through, uh, you know, a uh, unit of infantry or cavalry. It really only works well on the flat terrain, though. It's hard to use on hills. I tend not to bring it because it's not super consistent. And a Flock of Doom is going to be a little bit more consistent, obviously way less damage, but you can still get a pretty impressive amount of DPS, especially on big infantry blobs, which Tanuin will tend to force when he's on uh, the uh, the Engine of the Gods here. Um, likewise, you know, Wisson's Wild Form, or you can do like Felcon did here and take Allure of Heaven's Skink as a support. I actually like this quite a bit. Uh, Harmonic Convergence to buff Tanuin's combat stats. Since on the Stegodon, like I mentioned, doesn't have amazing melee attack and defense, although Frenzy certainly helps. The charge bonus is excellent, but that, uh, that Harmonic Convergence will give him the melee stats, be able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with just about anybody. Uh, likewise, Curse the Midnight Wind, uh, you know, great melee attack debuff to, again, make him more tanky in melee. Wind Blast to Blast Blobs. Honestly, this is a, you have a number of options here. I don't know that I would want to take all of those. Like, let's say you take... Um, <clears throat> Uh, these two with with Tehenowin, and then maybe I might honestly just take Harmonic Convergence with the Skink Bro, and then maybe take one of these items too, uh, Cube of Darkness. In certain matchups, this is an item that people forget about, but greatly reduced power recharge rate. This is a super strong item, guys. Like in any matchup where you're going to be facing a lot of magic, vampires of either kind, um, high elves especially as well. Uh, casting this Cube of Darkness can help slow down their Winds of Magic generation rate. Greatly reduced power recharge rate is very impactful, especially if the caster doesn't have Arcane Conduit or Greater Arcane Conduit. It's not going to be as impactful, but it basically will nullify the the power recharge rate portion of Greater Arcane Conduit. Uh, it won't nullify the power reserve part of it, obviously, but you can kind of debuff that way. Anyway, getting off track. Back to Tehenowin. His other abilities, obviously, you've got this uh, this item here, the Plaque of Sotek. So every time he's casting a spell, he gets 22% damage resistance. If you're planning on doing a build where you try and spam Wild Heart and get as much magic as possible, this is absolutely worth taking. 22% damage resistance for 21 seconds is a long time, and especially if you're if you're spamming Flocks of Doom. Uh, that definitely can give him a lot more tankiness, especially given that he already has baseline 5% from this portent of woding, war, warding ability, not woding, that would be uh, cool though if it gave him like woad paint. Uh, anyway, uh, this other one here as well, uh, constant AoE poison is really nice. I mean, granted, Lizardmen already have tons and tons of poison damage, but it what it means is like your Saurus all of a sudden do poison damage, you know, your Carnosaur that's potentially supporting, or like those uh, Bastilodon Rev Crystals that are supporting also get poison damage. And 8% charge bonus is... Again, really nice, not only for Tehenowin himself, but for other charge-oriented monsters, like if you've got him rolling with more Stegodons, or even, you know, uh, Carnosaurs have 50 charge bonus, Feral even, with the Frenzy, has even more. So you definitely can get some good value out of that. He does have other mount options as well. You don't see him typically as much. Uh, the cold one, or the horned one, actually can be a decent option if you're running a, a cavalry-focused build and you want your your cold ones to have poison attacks. You can run him as support, and then you've still got terror from the transformation of Kadan. You don't necessarily have to be as big of a target. 
especially if you're worried about uh, missiles. I definitely, I've used this map mount in the past, and I think it's pretty solid. Taking him on foot, he's a little bit squishy, but he is still a pretty strong combatant on foot. Good armor piercing damage, decent stats, only 75 armor, but yeah, I definitely would recommend taking him on a mount. He does get pretty expensive, um, so I definitely understand taking the double rev crystal to try and heal him. Uh, Felcon had him in a little bit of a cheaper kit, I guess, and I I didn't see... I think he just had Transformation of Kadan, right? So maybe that makes sense why you would cut uh, Wildheart. I still would probably keep Arcane Conduit, though, because you get free wins of magic from that. Then you could also cut this Black of Sotek. Makes him a little bit cheaper, but honestly, I think getting that extra wins of magic spam and the extra damage resistance, probably worth it if you have him this expensive already. But uh, anyway, I've rambled on long enough. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you do like this sort of content, be sure to like, subscribe, hit that bell notification button. Every time I upload a new video, you'll be notified. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.